Greetings from Lipscomb University. Thank you for joining us for this live broadcast. I'm in the Welcome Center. Here we are thinking about an alive and dynamic campus that right now isn't quite that way. Uh, but as a community, we want to continue to communicate, and so I thought it might be, might be helpful to use this vehicle uh, to do that. I was thinking on the way over that it was just a year ago, life was very, very different. A year ago today, some of us were in New York anticipating a game in Madison Square Garden, the NMIT in semifinals with the Lipscomb Bison playing Wichita. Here we were having been disappointed earlier in the playoffs in the A-Sun, but all of a sudden now we're about to be in the finals uh, for the NIT. Uh, we'd had four or five nationally televised games and there was Wichita in front of us and well, you know the outcome. That was an exciting night and one of the highlights of our basketball program. Well, that was a year ago, and you come forward a few months, and, well, most of us remember Christmas. Most of us remember gathering as families and celebrating holidays in December, coming back to school in January, and then looking forward to a wonderful semester with all of those signature moments and then even graduation for those for those of you who have worked really hard the last uh, four years, well, life changed. Uh, life changed in a big way. We, we'd heard about this virus in China, and we perhaps followed it on the news, but the reality is uh, none of us really thought it would be like this. And so literally weeks later, uh, we find ourselves not with the Bison Square, like the picture behind me, filled with energetic students on a dynamic and alive campus. But frankly, there are just a few of us here today making uh, this, this moment of communication with you. And we're doing that in a moment where colleges have come to a standstill across the country in terms of any residential life. The economy has crashed and had moments that are as bad as any of those since the Depression. Uh, some of our community have lost jobs. Uh, others are fearful of this virus and checking daily and trying to do everything to avoid it. And we see on television this unrelenting sense of tragedy. Life is very, very different. Before coming to Lipscomb, I was a college professor. I taught law on the West Coast. And I, I taught in an area called dispute resolution and in that teaching, I would often say something that seems so relevant today. I would suggest that a crisis, uh, that moment where something is really, really intense and perhaps very wrong, has both danger and also opportunity. It's not hard to define the danger of this moment in our nation, in our world, in our city, or perhaps in our own families. The virus that we can't define, that we can't yet have a vaccine for, that seems to invade us from all directions and is completely unpredictable in who it will take, who it will harm, and how it will go is a tremendous danger. And yet, as I share with you today, I want you to work hard with me to see what are also opportunities. Uh, in fact, think of them already. I was on the phone or online with uh, about 26 students Sunday afternoon, and as I was talking to them, I was listening hard because they'd been out of school for a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden they were home for a couple of weeks, and I was listening to how they were reacting and what they were saying. And I begin to hear, yes, life has been disrupted. And yes, I'm really disappointed. I didn't get to do this or that. But then they'd say, man, you know, I had great rest for the first three or four days. I really slept. And I haven't been with family this much since I graduated from high school. And I've had time to, to read, not those books that are assigned, but a book or two that I want. And I've had this moment where I could think deeply and think spiritually, uh, ask, at least wrestle with the really big questions that I have the time to wrestle with in a context that makes them so much more important. And so here we are today, recognizing there is a crisis and it is very, very serious. 
but also recognizing that in this moment and as we respond, there are opportunities. And those opportunities may provide each of us rich perspectives and important priorities and great opportunities for service. Uh, they need to be on the list as well. Well, what have we done at Lipscomb? I know you don't want to probably go through the iteration of everything. In fact, I sent to our Board of Trustees earlier in the week, I sent to them this sense that uh, here are 30 pages of the things your community has done just in the last four weeks. It was a long, long list. I won't list them all, but let me give you just an overview of uh, what has happened as we've tried to manage this particular moment. The first thing we always do is pull together a crisis management team. On a university, it's a tremendous blessing to have people who have expertise in so many different areas. And in a matter of an hour or two, when we realize there's a crisis, they're gathered together. And sitting at the table will be uh, our general counsel and our risk manager and the head of our medical group, the head of our counseling group, those involved in student life, uh, faculty who have expertise in particular fields that are appropriate. And, and literally, we pull that group together and we commit to be together perhaps hours and hours the first day or two. And then they've been together now virtually every single day, every single morning for weeks. And it's out of that expertise and that passion and that commitment that all of a sudden for our community, uh, we're able to manage uh, this challenge. Well, we realized once we begin to understand this better that we first had to think about our students who were not on the campus in Nashville, but were all over the world. Uh, we had students in Australia and Costa Rica and Portugal and Italy and Austria and perhaps other countries, and they were all having perhaps the time of their life studying and teaching overseas, and yet they had to get home. And we began working with risk managers and our global learning people and an international consulting firm that does all kinds of amazing things for us with the single objective of getting those folks back to their homes in the United States. It took about three weeks. Uh, it took some really important work, but we were all thrilled when uh, the last plane landed and we knew that our community was back in this country. Immediately after that, we realized that we needed to institute uh, new protocol and new activities and new resources medically. We have a fine health center here on campus, but we knew it would change in its focus and its orientation. In reality, that's a health center, and we are a community of about 5,000 students and faculty and staff, and we wanted it to be a resource for people uh, during this important time. And so new resources were brought in, and some of the faculty in our graduate and undergraduate uh, health care programs joined them and together, day after day after day, that has been a resource not only for the faculty, staff, students that are here, but now even a resource for students that are all over the country. And every day call in and say, I've got this question or I need this help. And they told me the other day, every telephone would call we get takes about 10 other telephone calls to actually resolve that issue. But we're there, we're trying to be helpful, uh, in that particular context. In addition to bringing our students home and being ready to take care of our community here, you know we had to close the residential part of our campus. We didn't want to do that. Uh, the community that we have and the relationships that are part of that are so precious to our kind of education. And yet, as we looked at all the people who were providing advice, it became obvious that the needs of our students could be taken care of in their homes much better than on a campus where, well, the social distancing is hard to control and the management of an outbreak of this virus uh, would be very, very challenging. And so students left for spring break. We extended it for just a week and then we had to communicate that probably it would be best that they not return. I had a student from Arizona I was talking to, and I thought his attitude was so great. He said, you know, President Lowry, uh, uh, all my stuff and my car are still at Lipscomb, and I live in Arizona. 
how am I going to get back? And that's a question uh, we'll deal with a little bit more in this conversation uh, later. Uh, but he was accepting of it, and he was thinking about possibilities, and there'll be a moment we get him together with uh, all he has. We closed the campus because it was necessary, and students have been absolutely wonderful about that. Uh, we closed the campus because we simply couldn't treat and care for people like we would like to. And, and frankly, we wanted you as students, all of our students, to get in a place where we could continue education. We are absolutely committed to getting this semester done, although we're obviously doing it in a different way. What way is that? Well, you know, we have taken, in a matter of two weeks, our faculty have moved the entire curriculum from a wonderful, intimate, face-to-face -face kind of moment to a completely remote, online kind of moment. Uh, you haven't been here to see how hard the faculty have worked. But last Monday, there was the moment where that work was done and students and faculty were together again, and at least from the reports I've heard, uh, there might be a glitch or two in terms of technology or some assistance that needed somewhere in the country or the world for the student to be in connection with us. But it appears to me that it's working quite well. In fact, yesterday, faculty were saying to me, it's really different. Uh, as I now teach online, there are students in the class that fully participate that might not have felt comfortable in a face-to-face -face context. And students have said, we're just glad to get back to class. We're glad to get on with this semester. And so while different, uh, we are optimistic that this will allow us to finish this semester extraordinarily well. In spite of all the complications and all the difficulties and all the things that people might have questions about or decisions that are still to be made, the number one focus is to make sure that the academic progress we anticipated will still take place. And, and frankly, in almost every field, we think that will happen. Uh, we're a bit challenged in some of the hard sciences and healthcare programs because uh, we've been cut off from some of the clinical experiences and some of the experiential education. But at the same time, we've learned about technology we didn't know about that can bring and virtually reproduce so many of the things that we like to do in a live format. So stay with us, we'll get through the semester, and I believe learning will take place, and we'll look back and say, while different, uh, that was still effective for my learning and for our faculty uh, for their teaching. Well, then we had one more transition, and this was also large, but perhaps uh, completely unseen by those who are listening to me. Uh, we had to take 900 faculty and staff and say to them, you can't work on campus, you must work at home because of the requirements uh, of our local and state uh, government. Boy, if you walk around today on the Lipscomb campus, it's quiet. I've walked through the halls of uh, the very, very dynamic buildings where activity takes place all day, every day, and they're quiet. But don't think that the people who served you here aren't still serving you. The medical center is in full force, although it's primarily doing some version of telemedicine as opposed to live interaction. The library is closed. I mean, if you go to the front doors, uh, they are locked, and we've done everything to sanitize that facility, but the librarians, they're working. And in this day, most of the materials most people use are digital anyway. And so the library is there. All you have to do is go on the website, and there will be people that help you uh, with everything you would have otherwise found. Uh, look around the campus, and you see that our counseling center, well, you would think if students are gone, they'd have no purpose, but they do have a purpose. In fact, uh, they're actually uh, beefing up what they do to not only have our live counselors working, but also, also to create a 24-7 counseling resource for our students who are in Tennessee. Student life people, boy, not in their offices, but they are working hard. We had chapel on Tuesday, online, but we had chapel. Uh, the intercultural development folks are still working intently with uh, our diverse student body. We can go person by person, and they are here working hard so that the experience our students have 
uh, is as uninterrupted as possible. And for our staff and our own faculty, we've initiated a brand new program called Lipscomb Cares because we know they have stress and we know uh, this is a difficult time for them and, and we want them to have the opportunity to uh, handle this working at home in a very successful way. I, I was talking to a faculty member yesterday and he was talking about how this is kind of different and he has to manage it with children, very young children, and I said, well, how do you do that? And he, he told me this, he said, well, they're used to me getting up in the morning and getting dressed and grabbing uh, my backpack and taking off to the office. He said, and I decided not to change that routine, so I still get up, I still get dressed, I grab my backpack, I kiss them goodbye, I walk out through the front door and go to the garage. And they think I've gone to work. And then my wife takes them to a different room, I go back in the back door and go upstairs and work all day and they're not disappointed because they didn't expect me to be there anyway. And then at four or five o'clock, I come back in the front door and we act like life is as normal as we can make it. Uh, it's been fascinating for all of us instantly, 900 people to say, I've got to figure out how to work at home. Some of the videos our students see from their faculty were recorded in closets <laughs> because that was the quiet place. Uh, some of us have realized that hour after hour after hour on uh, any of the Zoom kind of uh, facilities we have, you've got to get up and exercise and do something else. But we're going to get this down, and we're going to get it down so that our university continues in its tremendous service. We invited you to ask questions, and while we don't have the capability to answer those person by person, I looked them all over this morning, and they really fall into three categories pretty quickly. And while you may have questions beyond this, and we will certainly answer them, uh, they fall into these three categories, so let me just give you the answer that I think will be helpful, and also refer you to a resource that can follow up my comments if you need additional information. Many have asked about graduation. Boy, graduation is a special moment. I I've told many people, if there's one moment in the life of the university, in the year of our work, that I most cherish, it's standing in the tunnel of Allen Arena as students and faculty are streaming in, the bagpipes lead the procession, uh, there are family and friends, 5,000 of them there, and I'm standing there, and the thought that goes through my mind is that they did it. They completed what they started out to do. Hundreds and hundreds of students that on that day will receive their degree and be recognized for it. And while there's a lot of other stuff that goes on in the life of a president over the course of a year, there is no moment that that precious. There's no moment where we feel like the mission of the institution and the hopes and desires and aspirations of students and the hard work that they've done all come together for that particular celebration. After talking with lots of people, uh, people in the medical field, people in government and the like, and after looking very closely at what other colleges have decided to do across the country, I am sorry to announce that we will not have a traditional graduation in May. But with all the discipline of that news, hang on for just a moment and let me kind of share with you what we will be doing. Uh, we simply don't believe that we will be allowed even to have that kind of crowd on campus that close to what will be the peak of this uh, difficult, difficult virus in the southeast. But we will in May have a special celebration of those who are getting their degrees. And uh, the provost, Craig Bledsoe, and I will read those magic words and he will present the candidates and I will share the words we share every time that based on the recommendation of the faculty, on the authority of the Board of Trustees, uh, I award you this particular degree. And so degrees will be awarded, and we're working with all the colleges to do some, some really interesting virtual things to bring students back in contact with other students and back in contact with their faculty. We will have a full baccalaureate service before the graduation service, recognizing the importance of the spiritual at this institution. 
And so save that date. Don't give it away. Uh, join this community, even though it might be virtual, but, but join this community, uh, and, and we will have a celebration uh, of that uh, achievement. But that's not the only one. What we're going to do is we're going to invite everyone who completes their degree work in May or everyone who degree completes it in August to join us in December, actually the 19th of December, where we will have a, a tremendous day uh, of formal commencement on the Lipscomb University campus. I would guess we'll have graduates in part of the day and undergraduates in another part of the day. We'll have the 5,000 people. We'll have the bagpipes. And you might have completed several months of work, or some will be in grad school, but families can gather. And on the other side of this crisis, with a sense of confidence and a sense of ease and perhaps a whole lot more relaxed, we will celebrate what our students have done. If you have other questions about graduation, uh, we have a special segment of our website you can go to. Just type in graduation at lipscomb.edu. We'll answer your questions and guide you through this. And I look forward, well, I look forward to that moment in December when I'm standing in the tunnel and all that's going on in the arena. And quietly I say to myself, they did it. This is the end. College is not about coming, it's about going. It's not about starting, it's about ending. And we will have that moment and that celebration. And if you're a student, I look forward to standing on the stage and handing you, perhaps not in the context of social distancing, but handing to you very personally your Lipscomb degree. Others have asked questions about refunds or the economic piece of all of this. And let me uh, share with you two or three things. First of all, let me put it in a little bit of perspective and then share some uh, policies that will come out later this week. In the largest context, uh, those that are looking at this say that uh, there will be a hit, uh, a financial impact on higher education of about $58 billion. And that's only looking forward as far as we can look forward with a whole lot of assumptions. The recent stimulus package that uh, was passed by Congress uh, allows for a piece of that to go to higher education, about $14 billion. So you can see all of a sudden this entire industry, this entire precious piece of what it is in America, higher education, is going to take a tremendous hit and undergo some tremendous financial challenges. Well, we'll work with that. Uh, I was talking with people just a couple of days ago. We think already it's cost a school like Lipscomb five, six, eight, ten million dollars. And that's before we even get into next fall. Uh, we will have some piece, a small piece of that federal package, but frankly, uh, we're going to work really hard so that that doesn't impact uh, the life of a student at this university. We appreciate the alumni and so many donors who step forward in these moments to say, let's make sure the education happens just exactly like it needs to happen. And we're going to make sure that our priority will be our students uh, and our faculty and what they do together in what we call college. We know that a number of people who lived on campus, about 1,500, when we invited you not to come back. And we know that you had paid for certain services that will not now need to be provided. And so we will be refunding on a prorated basis the cost of room and board from uh, the end of the extended spring break until the end of the semester. I don't have that particular number with me today. In fact, we're still working on some of the costs that have to go into that. But uh, I want you to know that we will have that figured out and have either a credit on your account or a refund to you by the 1st of May. Now, if you are a graduating senior, it most likely will be a refund. Uh, if you're a continuing student, it most likely will be a credit to your account in the fall. And for all of you, if there's a balance on your account, eh, we probably need to apply it to that first. There will be a policy statement in just a, a few hours on this. And when you read that and absorb that, uh, and you have any other questions, uh, I'd like you to contact Daryl Duncan. Daryl's an outstanding person in our finance area. Daryl Duncan at lipscomb.edu. 
and he will be happy to answer specific questions for you. And, and finally, residential life. Well, boy, that's an important area. And, and we know that uh, while you left quickly, uh, there's a challenge in getting all your stuff back together with you at home. Uh, actually, about uh, 700 students have already completed that. We have a process that we think is organized and thoughtful and works within the guidelines uh, as they are uh, expressed by state and federal government. And we're inviting you to come back in an orderly way to get those belongings. But we also are committing that if for some reason that's impossible, we will uh, have them packed uh, we will have our people supervise that packing. Uh, we'll have professional people doing it, and we'll store that until there's some reasonable way to get to you. <laughs> I was asking the other day, well, what do you do if there are two people in a room? How do we know whose stuff is whose? And, and what we'll do, and it would seem so simple when I thought about it, Lori Sane said, well, look, we'll just get an iPhone, and uh, we'll just have the student on the other end of this, and we'll show the TV and they'll tell us who owns the TV and we'll separate that into the right uh, packaging uh, requirements. I, I know this is complex and I know it's difficult. Uh, I know it's inconvenient and you'll have to do some strategic work. We'll work with you on that. And if you have specific questions, do contact Lori, Lori Sane at Lipscomb.edu. Well, what does the future look like? I can't tell you. Uh, what will happen in the next two months, four months, six months, year, I don't know. But I do know that this entire community is invested in every piece of that future being outstanding. We're working right now to convert Maymester and Summer School to an online program. We're working on things like, well, if you're taking a chemistry program in the summer, what about the labs? And there are some new and creative ways to do that. And we are fully planning that in August, this university will open again in all of its fullness. Our community will gather again and continue the good work that we have done for 130 years. Now, obviously, that's dependent on the curve of this virus. That's obviously dependent upon state and local government and their guidance and direction. Obviously, it's also dependent upon even our own community and our hope for its health and its, its welfare. But we're looking forward in an optimistic way. And we believe that while these moments of crisis are very, very disrupting, uh, there's a resilience in our people, in our nation, that will allow us to eventually get back on track. Uh, I was thinking back, you know, Lipscomb was established in 1891. A lot has happened since 1891. Uh, Lipscomb has lived through two world wars. It's lived through a depression. It's lived through several buildings burning to the ground during that time. It's lived through all kinds of really difficult moments. And while they were extraordinarily difficult, and we have great empathy for the people who had to navigate them, the reality is they did. And this university is strong, and this university is vital, and this university will be sustainable long into the future. So no, we're planning, no, we're praying, and we would ask you to join us in that. And no, we're expecting that there will be another side to what we now face. I heard someone speak the other day, and he was trying to make the point that I thought was so important. He was looking back in history, and he said when, when the plagues happened or these huge worldwide difficult moments, he said historians would look and find that the Christian community approached it perhaps somewhat differently than other communities. And, and I think there's some truth in that. Because we claim a larger story. And these moments of great threat and calamity, well, they're part of that larger story. The point he was trying to make, he said, the Christian community often has a sense of resilience and hope. And it's that resilience and that hope that allows us to move forward. And I wouldn't say the Christian community is the only community that has those, but I think a faith basis gives us something that's a foundation for our lives, a foundation for our relationship to each other, and it obviously is such an important part of this university. Well, what would David Lipscomb say to us? Yeah, I don't know. 
Uh, but, but if he could say something, I think he would say, uh, I, I want you to be courageous. I want you to be tenacious. I want you to be confident. I lived through the Civil War, he would say. And this institution was established 30 or so years beyond that, and it still continues to carry out its mission. I've said several times this week, reminded us of uh, our mascot. I, I don't really know who chose it. I don't really know why it was chosen. But I was in Wyoming last summer, and there on the plains of Wyoming, the grasses were green, and the trees were in their fullness, and the mountains were gorgeous, and here were the bison. Large animals slowly walking across the prairie. And, and in the springtime, it looked wonderful but we all know they had to live through winter to get there. And I walked into a little shop that had photographs, and there was one on the wall about four feet by six feet maybe, and instead of the silhouette of this bison, the bison was looking straight at the camera. And it was obviously taken in the winter time, and here is ice just cased, encasing its face. And here's the snow, and you can imagine the cold. But I looked in the eyes of that photograph, and the eyes of the bison, and I think it was telling me the same thing. We can do this. We can be tenacious. We can be resilient. We can, in this difficult moment, in fact, have a great sense of confidence. We have a great sense of confidence in this community, and you, our alumni, our students, our faculty, and staff. We have a great sense of confidence in those who are our friends and share this mission. We have a great sense of confidence in our God who assured us in so many ways, in so many scriptures, that no matter what was happening, his care and his presence would remain. May God bless you. We look forward to some wonderful times ahead we look forward to sharing this community as community. And we look forward to what God will do in each of our lives. God bless you all.